Torquay, a quintessentially English seaside resort. It's the capital of the English Riviera, the birthplace of Agatha Christie. But the South Devon town is perhaps best known as the home of one of the most popular television sitcoms ever made. It all began here at the Hotel Glen Eagles in Ashildon Road in 1971. The Monty Python team were filming nearby. Of all the hotels in Torquay they could have stayed at, they were booked in at this one. The rest, as they say, is history. The owner at the time was a chap called Donald Sinclair, who was an ex-naval commander, a, a peppery little man, not six foot six like Cleese was, but the, the opposite, in fact, a small man, but very peppery and very correct, and didn't like hotel guests. Would have been a wonderful job if it wasn't for the guests. The guests spoiled his job. <laughs> Various stories come out about Donald Sinclair. Uh, two or three come to mind. One, Eric Idle, who was one of the Monty Python crew, had a briefcase in reception. And he had an alarm clock in there that was ticking. And Sinclair thought, my God, there's a bomb in there. And he threw it over the cliff. Gilliam, Terry Gilliam, uh, who was an American, in fact. Uh, and as you know, the Americans tend to eat in a slightly different way to the way we do. They will cut their food, put the knife down, take the fork into the other hand, and then pick it, food up with the fork. Well, this didn't suit Sinclair at all. This wasn't British. So <laughs> as Gilliam was doing this, he would walk past and pick up the knife and say, sorry, we don't eat like that here. For all but one of the pythons, it proved all too much, and they packed their bags and left. But John Cleese chose to remain at the Glen Eagles. The talented young comedy writer was at work. It was observing Donald Sinclair, Cleese has said, that first gave him the idea for the character that became Basil Fawlty. All good comedy comes from what people have done and said. You can't create out of your head a very, very funny situation, or at least very rarely. It's got to be inspired by, my God, he said that, he did that, I don't believe it, I'll recall that and I'll, I'll use it to good effect later on. Richard Saunders remembers trying to order a drink from Mr Sinclair while staying at the Glen Eagles on a family holiday. I walked up to the bar, which was a fairly long bar, about 15 feet long then, at the end of the room, and he was behind the bar and I walked up, I said, oh, two gin and tonics in, can I have a pint please? He put his hands up and he reached for this grill and slammed the grill down he said, uh, the bar's closed, but I'm resident here. He said, I don't care, the bar's closed. So my colleague looked at me and he said, come down to Queen's Hotel. I'm staying down there and we can have a pint down there. So down we went and as I was walking out, this fella said to me, and where do you think you're going? And I said, uh, oh, I'm just popping down the Queen's. I have a drink with my friend, you won't serve me. He said, if you go out and you're not back by 11 o'clock, the door will be closed. And uh, when I came back, the front door was closed, locked couldn't get in. So I thought, this is ridiculous. My wife and daughter's in there. So I thumped on the door. Suddenly a window went up and he poked his head out the window with his pyjamas on. He said, I told you you'd be locked out if you weren't. I said, if you don't open this door, I should bash it in. Well, after about three or four minutes, suddenly the door opened. He said, and he slammed it afterwards. He must have woke everybody up in the hotel. And he said, don't ever let it happen again. Such incidents led several guests to seek alternative accommodation. Ian Jones's parents owned a rival hotel. Our hotel, um, the Coppice, was situated within a few hundred yards of the Glen Eagles. Um, and we used to get sort of fugitives from the Glen Eagles used to come knocking on our door pleading for accommodation. One day we, uh, my daughter wanted to get in the swimming pool. And so I bought a little blow-up plastic ball you could buy in those days and blow it up and plug it and I was throwing it into the pool with her and she was throwing it back to me and then also as she threw it back this Sinclair came up took the boy he said no ball games round by the swimming pool I said it's only a little plastic he said you can have it when you leave everything was too much trouble people would come downstairs and and, uh, and say excuse me say what could you call me a taxi oh, all right if I have to when I tell these stories, people look at me and they say, you're kidding. I said, that is absolutely true. 
and I can well understand why John Cleese went away and thought, now this will make a very nice programme. Donald Sinclair was married to a Scotswoman called Betty. Betty tried to keep the peace to the extent uh, when she went out shopping, she would sometimes lock him in the flat upstairs and say to the staff, now don't let him out, he's only going to upset you. Betty Sinclair was uh, a very formidable woman and it was always that um, uh, she seemed to make the bullets and then Donald would, would fire them. My parents used to go out every Thursday night during the summer. They'd go out with Donald and Betty out to a country pub and then when they came back, um, we'd be eagerly awaiting their return so they could relate to us the latest episodes that had occurred at um, the Glen Eagles during the previous week. And what, what used to happen was my mother would sit in the back of the car on the way out and Betty would tell my mother the terrible things that he'd said to the guests during the week and Donald would be sat in the front with my father and, uh, and, and he'd tell my, my father the terrible things that she'd driven him to say. Another thing Donald Sinclair had in common with Basil, he didn't like builders. Fred Tribe, who did regular building work for the Sinclairs, recalls Donald's reaction when a colleague accidentally set fire to a tree in the hotel grounds. He said, look at my tree. He got very annoyed and he dropped down on his knees and in the end he was beating the, the gravel with his hand saying, you damn builders, what have you you've done? Look. And uh, with that, he was all upset. With that, out came his wife and said, Donald, darling, what are you doing down there? And he st still went on about these blasted builders. Donald Sinclair died in 1981. His relatives, who still live locally, declined to be interviewed, but they did say they felt he'd been rather maligned. He may have been eccentric, but was he really as bad as all that? This family has happy memories of Mr Sinclair. Linda Baker chose the Glen Eagles as the venue for her wedding reception. We had heard that he did rather like to be firm with everyone, so we hoped he wouldn't be on the day. And we didn't have any reports that he had been. No guests seemed to be upset, so it was fine. Commander Sinclair, as he says himself, could be a little brusque from time to time and uh, and Betty was certainly a talker so there are elements of truth in the in the couple but I think very much exaggerated Bob French agrees he used to advise Mrs Sinclair on interior design I think there has been a mythology of forty towers people are often looking for stories to come out of that hotel, whereas most of the stories, in fact, came out of the fertile minds of the scriptwriters. There was probably some jealousy there because there's no doubt about it, she had one of the nicest hotels in Torquay. The Glen Eagles Hotel, in fact, was a very nice hotel, beautifully appointed. And um, it was just that perhaps it lacked a little in the um, service department. So much for Basil and Sybil. But who inspired Manuel, the hapless waiter from Barcelona? Apparently, there are several possible candidates. There must have been many, many Spanish waiters that have, uh, you know, spilt drinks down laps in Torquay over the years, I would have thought, very many, and certainly quite a few that uh, had no grasp of the language at all. There was a, a waiter who worked here, a foreign waiter. Um, whether Manuel was based on that, we don't know, but I, he got so fed up with working for Donald Sinclair that he called a taxi and said, take me to London quick. And the taxi drove it, God knows what it cost, to drive him to London. Mark Robinson believes Manuel was based on a Greek waiter he used to work with called George. I've seen him take out tea when people ask for coffee and when people ask for Earl Grey tea, give them normal tea when they've asked for skim milk, we haven't got skim milk in the kitchen go and put half the milk away and pour water in so he got, so it looked like skim milk for people. And it was a conference at the hotel and, and he served the um, coffee and they asked for a sec second cup of coffee and he went up to them and said, you pay me bloody money, you get bloody coffee. Don't pay me bloody money, you don't get no bloody coffee. And of course, I think that's where John Cleese got his idea because he used to come into the hotel and have um, afternoon teas there. Wherever you are in Torquay, you're never very far from a hotel or guest house. So, what do the town's hoteliers make of its close association with Faulty Towers?
There's a slight embarrassment, I think it's true to say. We've, it is um, a reputation that perhaps unkindly we've had to live with since the early 70s, but uh, I can assure you that a lot of hotels in this bay particularly are run a lot more professional than perhaps Forty Towers was. That they may be embarrassed, but I'm very proud of it. But whatever happens at the end of the day, Torquay is getting a very, very good plug from a cult comedy, and uh, I'm sure everyone in the Bay is grateful for it. There are very few people without a sense of humour here uh, who would say, um, mm, well, we really don't like that sort of publicity here. There are a few. We get people from all over the world. It's astonishing. Is this where Faulty Town started? Or the you know, Australians? Ah, it doesn't look like the place to me, mate. But we, and the coaches detour past the front of the hotel, off the main road. Six or seven coaches every morning come past and you can see the driver pointing to the hotel. It's a shrine. <laughs> Thank you.